Ah, ta-da. Okay. Yeah, accomplishment. Um, so, I am uh, the alternate for this, uh, this slot. Um, I'm going to be talking about Android application security pitfalls, because that's apparently all I talk about anymore is Android application security and stuff. Um, so hopefully you'll get something out of this, even if you were here for Ryan Permi's talk. So uh, I'm Zach Lanier. I work for uh, Acumont Labs uh, as a senior research consultant, which is a fancy way of saying we hack on, you know, weird stuff. Um, I'm also the CH in Team Jack, which is uh, John Overhide's the uh, JO, and we do a lot of stuff around Android security. I'm a, a net web mobile app pen tester type from uh, from your, and uh, I've gotten into mobile stuff uh, a few years ago. So that's my old company. So ignore that. Um, so the me flipping too fast. So we're gonna talk a little bit about Android just to set the stage, in case you don't know anything about Android. I assume that some people are just now getting into mobile and may have an Android device but don't know the internals about it. So then we'll talk a little bit about app distribution and just set the stage for some things. Um, did I cut out? Okay. Uh, talk, a little, talk a little bit about how apps work and then actually dive into issues, um, things that I've seen in testing um, Android applications and um, as well as some uh, solutions or recommendations around fixing those issues, and then finally, uh, conclusion. So what is Android inside its vendor? Um, so it's typically, most Android devices are on ARM, have ARM cores. They're, the, whatever system on chip that they're on, it's almost always gonna be ARM. There are some x86 boxes out there running, uh, running Android, but by and large, most things are gonna come across uh, run on ARM. Older versions of Android uh, are built on the Linux 2.6.3x series kernel. Newer ones are built on um, 3.0, so ice cream sandwich and jelly bean and whatnot. Um, it's built on a series of native libraries. Uh, your libc, which in, in this case is actually Bionic, which presents some differences in things that are included because it's BSD um, libc, not uh, glibc. WebKit, uh, which is always bug-free, OpenSSL, uh, so forth and so on. Um, the Android runtime is composed primarily of the Dalvik virtual machine, which um, although applications are written in Java mostly, they're actually converted into a different uh, bytecode format called Dalvik uh, executable or DEX. And the Dalvik VM is register-based, not stack-based VM versus, say, the Java VM. So this presents interesting issues sometimes around reverse engineering. Um, uh, applications obviously run inside the Dalvik virtual machine, and it's basically a one-to-one -one process mapping for every time you run a an Android application, you will see a unique process entry for it in uh, Linux's you know, process table. So this is the obligatory Android stack um, going down to uh, special kernel drivers. Um, that uh, Android wrote, or that Google and the Android team wrote. Um, so there's some deviation from your regular, uh, your normal vanilla Linux. So quick overview of that. Um, big thing that people complain about uh, with Android is this uh, version fragmentation. As of April 2nd, this is the most current data. Um, there's a lot of cho there are a lot of choke points here. Uh, carriers, OEMs, uh, carriers might be the choke point to push out over the air updates for whatever reason, um, obs planned obsolescence or uh, uh, acceptance testing, they won't push out uh, updates. And we end up with this nice fragmented pie chart. Um, this is a, there is a thing called CTS, Compatibility Test Suite, that Android subjects OEMs to. And part of that includes security tests so that in order for a device to be licensed, quote unquote licensed, there's no licensing fee, to be licensed to use Android, they have to meet the CTS tests. And some of those have making sure that file permissions are sane um, and that you know there aren't massively privileged uh, applications, things like that. But you'll see in this chart, um, 2.3 uh, to 2.3.2, 
um, is, well, it's actually 2.3.3 2.3.7 is a very significant chunk of this chart, and those are your ginger your gingerbread devices that won't you know necessarily receive kernel patches because they're not getting updated versions of Android, which means that combined with complete lack of mitigations, uh, chance for you know nice privilege escalations. Anyway, sandboxing on Android is not really sandboxing. Um, it's not like iOS where there are there's an actual uh, you know like seatbelt on iOS. Um, actually enforces a more mandatory access control type sandbox, where on Android it's uh, simply assigning uh, an application and the processes associated with it a unique user ID and group ID, and then assigning really tighter file permissions so that um, apps can't clobber each other's data on the file system. And um, interaction between these things and uh, API and programmatic access are enforced by the Android runtime based on you know, UID and GID and some other things. So you'll see here up at the top, each, um, uh, you'll see here in the data, data directory where apps store their data, each one of these packages data directories have a unique user ID and group ID assigned to them. And the permissions are such that only this user ID can write this and only this um, group ID can, uh, is the only other thing that can read this. So. That prevents App 3 from clobbering App 7's stuff. Um, and we can see files that are created in those uh, subdirectories, like the databases directory for this crypt SQL package uh, has um, access such that only App 44 can read and write. So a slight deviation about exploit mitigations in, um, in Android. It, uh, older exploit mitigations were pretty much non-existent. We actually did have, um, you know, your chance for vanilla stack-based buffer overflows. The stack um, between these two runs is, is um, was randomized, but is still writable and executable. And uh, the uh, mmap section where files are mapped into memory and things like libraries as well, and the heap and the base address of the uh, target executable, the uh, target binary were not randomized, so you know your ret to libc attacks still worked. Um, in Android 2.3, they introduced uh, an actual non-executable stack and a non-executable heap. So that's one step further, except that uh, they still didn't do uh, randomization of some other things. In Ice Cream Sandwich, they added partial or better, slightly better ASLR, address space layout randomization. So here is between these two um, these two runs of just looking at memory maps for uh, a, a given process. The um, mmap section where, say, this, these libraries are mapped is, you know, random between two runs. Uh, the linker, however, is not, and the stack um, is also random. And the base address of the binary is not. So then finally, they did full ASLR um, along with other things to help randomize, uh, further randomize um, memory with things like position independent uh, executables, strengthening ASLR, uh, doing things like rel row and bind now to reorder sections in a program to make it even harder to predict, um, to reorder, reorder sections of a program so that it was more difficult to find um, usable addresses as well as to read only. Cutting out, I think. Set, set table to read only to make to make um, overriding entries in there difficult. So you know, like overriding sprintf to step uh, as by now also uh, by resolving the location of um, functions at runtime rather than at uh, when that function was called. So. We can also see uh, that, where are we? So this is actually in, um, on, so this is a version of Android that runs Linux kernel 3. We see here that uh, the base address is randomized. We see that the linker address is, the base is randomized. Uh, the MAP section where a library has been loaded is randomized. The heap is randomized. The stack is randomized, and they're not executable. Um, 
They also added a couple of other things, uh, dmessage restrict, which was a, uh, if you've ever run like the dmessage command on a Unix box, you know, it spits out a bunch of log information from the system. Um, dmessage restrict um, helped uh, prevent leakage of certain bits of kernel information that could be useful in exploit development, as well as added in kpointer restrict, which um, made it more difficult to find uh, symbols in kernel, kernel memory that would be useful in kernel privilege escalations. So like cat proc uh, kl sims no longer leaks anything. Um, there's weak ASLR um, in something like Zygo because there's this shared uh, there's a shared pool of memory across every process that gets spawned from Zygote. Zygote's the thing that starts starts an application when you launch it and starts the Dalvik VM and loads everything that it need, needs to. But for performance reasons, certain libraries and um, uh, classes and things of that nature are shared across all processes. So, you know, go explore that. Um, not necessarily uh, realistic. I know there's like red text down here that's a little more difficult to read, but it says 32-bit ASLR on a long enough timeline. If you have a lot of patience, you know you you could brute force uh, an address, um, and that doesn't this stuff doesn't necessarily apply to like heap exploitation or anything. Future mitigations that um, are probably never going to happen. Um, Android could implement code signing uh, enforcement so that apps that are signed, that's the only code running in memory, and it can't go fetch additional um, additional libraries from the internet and load them, which happens. Um, maybe hardening some of the system libraries that are included, like Bionic. There are still some versions of Android out there that don't have, um, you know, compiler and linker mitigations haven't been considered for uh, the libraries that everything's built on, like building a uh, bricks on sand. And then finally, uh, SE Android, which is slowly making its way into the mainstream, uh, which is a mandatory access control system for Linux, uh, being ported to Android. The Samsung Galaxy S4, I believe, actually uh, uses SE Android. So there's a production device out there that uses that. So app overview. Applications have to be signed. Uh, they can be self-signed by a developer. There's no CA. Um, there's no certificate validation chain. There's no code signing enforcement or anything like that. Anyone can sign up for the, the Google Play or Android market and publish applications. Uh, they do some dynamic app, app analysis via Bouncer, um, but it has actually been defeated uh, through, it's actually just a QEMU instance that they instrument, and uh, it's really easy to detect um, that you're in there and make your malware act differently. So apps are really just uh, in an APK, which is a glorified zip file, which has, amongst other things, um, classes.dex, which is the, the Dalvik executable bytecode uh, compiled with um, a bunch of, you know, the, the code itself as well as a bunch of other data. And uh, the manifest, which defines a lot of things about the application, um, which we'll, we'll see here in a second. Uh, any additional resources like images, layout files to tell where UI elements need to go. Um, any supporting native libraries, um, you can use JNI to call into native code in Android. You see this especially for antivirus applications or any game application that uses really, you know, accelerated or fancy graphics or anything like that. And then graphic signature files um, that just have the, um, you know, the digest for all the files that are in there to make sure that tampered with. So the manifest, uh, every application, um, even if it doesn't have something the user interacts with, uh, needs to have a manifest which defines the, the target uh, version of Android that it, um, it's built for, uh, any minimum requirements, as well as um, activities which are the UI, the UI panes that the, the, um, the user interacts with. Um, and um, any intent filters, which are we'll discuss intents a little bit later, but just defines how, what types of messages it will respond to via IPC. Um, and uh, also, finally, perhaps most importantly, and other things, but uh, permissions, which the capabilities that the application is actually requesting. That's probably one of the more important things if you're looking at these um, next to intents. 
So permissions, you've seen this screen before. When you go and install an application, you get prompted um, to install it, and it wants all these permissions, and you either say OK or cancel. So things like making a phone call, reading an SMS, writing an SMS, vibrating the phone, um, opening up uh, you know, a socket, which we just see as network communications, and accessing um, you know, various bits of data. So permissions are typically enforced at a high level for programmatic things, um, like accessing contacts or accessing uh, SMS messages or what have you. But there are certain things that um, are enforced within the kernel based on group membership, for instance. So android.permission.internet uh, actually instructs the system, uh, the pa package manager instructs the system to add the user ID for the application into a supplemental group 3003, which is uh, the INET group which allows the, that user to uh, create arbitrary, just open sockets, basically, and uh, have network access. Then there are some other things, like um, there are groups for accessing external storage of the SD card, uh, because the, that particular mount point is set that only the groups, the, the group, um, members of that group can actually read and write that, uh, that mount point. So permissions are not terribly granular in the sense that you could say limit an application f to only talking to a certain remote host. It either has no doesn't. Um, this uh, this could be solved by SE Android, um, but probably complexity and the uh, you know battery. So again, uh, the Dalvik VM is not really a sandbox. Um, pop out of the Dalvik virtual machine um, with just native code. You're still only limited to whatever privileges that particular UID has, um, but whatever. Um, and again, it doesn't do Android doesn't enforce code signing like iOS, so native code can just be fetched remotely from the internet and loaded. So the thing you're probably more interested in. Um, common issues, again, kind of things that I've seen um, over the past few years. So permissions issues, uh, over-granting or under-granting of permissions, uh, insecure transmission of sensitive data, insecure storage, information leakage um, through, log uh, through log buffers, uh, API issues, and then, although we won't have time to really dive into Flash or WebKit or whatever, inheritance of bugs. If the framework that something is built on is buggy, then you know, just kick the, kick the sand out from under the bricks. So permit, permissions in brief. I mentioned that um, there are permissions like internet, send SMS, read contacts, etc. These are granted at ap application install time, um, by, which is the thing that installs um, installs packages and, and talks to other components to um, you know set up the file system for the app and everything. They're actually checked at the time that a call, uh, the time of a function or method call. Uh, that includes things like creating a socket object, accessing um, Bluetooth functionality, uh, reading or writing data to, from, to or from a content provider, uh, which is uh, could be anything on the back end, but just serves data up in a you know re, uh, a normalized way. Sometimes at a lower level, these checks for these permissions are done in uh, uh, an ink. They're done in a variety of ways, sometimes inconsistently and in ways that might lead developers to not understand what permissions they, they really need. So we already saw that slide. Um, so I did some research with uh, a colleague when, uh, at Veracode last year, where I previously worked, uh, on mapping out Android permissions and their requirements and the ways they were being checked across the Android API uh, and different versions of the Android API. So as it turns out, that the reference documentation uh, includes most permission requirements for various parts of the uh, of the API, but it's not 100% or 100% accurate. Um, so this leads to undergranting of of per, per, uh, permissions or privileges, which could be a reliability issue if uh, you know something is called and the caller doesn't have permissions for it. A security exception is thrown, and the application most likely crashes. Uh, it just annoys users. And then there's overgranting, where because of not understanding what the requirements really are, uh, permission requirements are, developers just throw all the permissions um, at the application to get these errors from, to stop popping up. So it's sort of like if that was a buggy application in some other way, 
a malicious application could take advantage of whatever that bug is and inherit uh, the permissions of that target application. Um, think AV apps, for instance. So here's an example of uh, the documentation doesn't match what uh, is actually happening. So for the Wi-Fi manager class, the start scan method, which is a fairly innocuous method, it, it's not really you know, damning or anything, um, doesn't actually list the permission requirements for, for start scan uh, in the documentation. It doesn't say anything about it. So actually looking at the, um, the source code for the Android API, we see that there is uh, enforce, enforce um, access permission um, and enforce change permission which uh, look to see if the caller has access Wi-Fi state or change Wi-Fi state um, when they call start scan. And that's verified by the tool that, um, that we used uh, at Veracode to, as a proof of concept to basically look and see in what class, what method, uh, what permission was being checked and how it was being checked. So the documentation match the reality. And there, you know, people would call this, the app would crash, whatever. Same thing with telephony manager. Um, this uh, for the get neighboring cell info uh, method, we see that uh, in the documentation it says that access course updates is the required permission, um, and this has been reported numerous times that this permission doesn't actually exist. There is no access course updates permission, and I don't know if there ever was. Um, as it turns out, they are actually, and they, there's even a comment in the uh, in the source code that says, "Oh, you know, access course updates." But looking at where, through a few levels, um, where this actually gets checked, it's access find location or access course location. And that's checked via enforced calling yourself uh, permission. So, you know, and here's the output from the tool that, in fact, says get neighboring cell info requires one of these two permissions, not this non-existent permission. So this just leads to developers having absolutely no idea what to do and just throwing, throwing all the permissions at the error so it goes away. So insecure transmissions, you know this one, stuff gets sent in the clear. Um, it still happens, um, you know, again, sorry for the font, but uh, weakly encrypted data in transit, not encrypting it at all, um, or passing authorization material even though the login process was encrypted, uh, ignoring certificate validation errors, um, not, you know, doing SSL pinning or anything uh, like that correctly, and falling back to plain text if something should fail or if the use staging environment bit is set to one or something. So a real world example, some researchers found that Google Client Login, which is the SSO uh, system for pretty much all of Google services, um, the authorization header uh, was actually sent over plain text HTTP on Wi-Fi when syncing for certain services like uh, Picasa um, and calendar and contacts. So even though Gmail, for instance, was over SSL and everything like that, these services weren't. This was fixed by, you know, simply snipping this value on, say, a shared Wi-Fi network. Uh, you know, you, you know the drill, super easy, whatever. Um, I hate this case study, but I, I like, it won't go away. Uh, Foursquared was a uh, Foursquare application for Android, since been deprecated, um, but and you know, Foursquare is a location-based social network I'm sure most of you are familiar with. And the API used to support um, OAuth or HTTP basic auth, uh, even though OAuth includes all these things to prevent replay attacks and whatnot. Um, Foursquare, uh, the Foursquare Android app, Android app used plain text HTTP uh, and HTTP basic auth. So, you know, steal the wonderful little a64 encode, encoded blob and check someone into Chippendales or wherever. Um, yeah, not really a big deal. You can check someone in somewhere else, but things like credential reuse kind of exacerbate this problem. And obviously, since most applications prefer Wi-Fi to cell radio, where uh, possible, you know, this is kind of a kind of a common issue. Um, and incidentally, that application had OAuth support in, but the guy just didn't want to use it. Um, I don't, I guess they've probably since used a different developer, who knows. So, you know, the advice there is any, any sensitive data or all data, if 
you can because it's you know phones are modern modern phones have enough power to do this and bandwidth isn't a huge concern um, all data leaving the device you know if, especially if it's sensitive should be encrypted and it's not like rocket science to put a few few extra lines in there to actually you know do proper SSL validation and this includes over carrier networks because you can't guarantee uh, who is or isn't snooping on what's going across a carrier's network and when security exceptions are thrown because of things like man in the middle attacks you know don't ignore those security exceptions and fall back to plain text maybe by the user that something is awry and don't proceed um, insecure storage of course uh, Rooted device, all bets are off because it's a rooted device. They have, you know, ACLs don't mean anything at that point. Um, Android devices do isolate apps, data directories, as I mentioned before, and try to lock down permissions. Uh, you know, if you leave USB debugging enabled, for instance, uh, except on newer Android devices where USB debugging actually has authentication, um, that's a pretty good opportunity for, you know, access, unfettered access to something. So just a little example application here where it actually stores this, uh, stores credentials in this shared preferences file, and they actually went out of the way to shoot themselves by saying, uh, shoot themselves in the foot by saying mode world readable and putting, you know, username and a password perhaps in plain text there. So derp. Um, the default mode for files that are created through uh, through Java, so databases, shared preferences, plain text files, any file that's touched through um, through Java uh, will uh, actually be set securely with appropriate permissions. But anything that up until Android 4.1, anything created through native code, um, when you called into JNI and then did something or executed an external command, that would inherit zygote's umask of nothing. Zero 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 zero, and subsequently set, subsequently set the permissions world readable and world writable. Again, this was fixed in Android 4.1, so Zygote actually has the same U mask now. This actually bit Skype in the in the butt because they had uh, pretty much everything in their application um, was created through native code, including uh, databases that had uh, had chat logs, had credentials, had personal identifying information about um, about that particular Skype user. Um, so, if as long as you could know what their username was, you could uh, you knew that it was the files directory, and then their username, and then a bunch of a bunch of files that were readable and writable by any other application. So, store only what is absolutely required. Obviously, um, you know, never use shared storage areas if you can avoid it, especially on older devices where uh, FAT uh, is the default file system that has no access control enforcement um, on that file system. Uh, leverage secure containers like uh, Android has ASEC containers and has these OB OBBs or opaque binary blobs that actually in provide a, a little bit more um, security, uh, secure storage. And using things like um, SQL Cipher if you have to use uh, the SQLite databases um, to store securely store sensitive data. Um, and don't go out of the way to sh shoot yourself in the foot by making world re readable or world writable um, permissions on files when you create them. So information leakage through logs. Simply running uh, ADB Logcat um, on your development machine will often y uh, yield a wealth of information. Here's just an example of me clicking on a link in an SMS message and the activity manager um, which subsequently launches whatever it is that will uh, read or requ request and read a URL, uh, HTTP URL. Um, you know that 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 activity gets logged. So not a big deal that you know some someone can see that I tap on links all day and and look at pictures of cats on the internet. Um, but at least then you know s simple things like this are are in fact logged. Um, so it's a trivial example. Um, up until Android 4.1, uh, applications could request the read logs permission, which meant they had access to the, the shared log buffer. And uh, now, third-party apps are no longer allowed to do that. But on older versions of Android, obviously, this still applies. So an example where this actually proved to be pretty helpful in an engagement, um, a, a Android app assessment engagement, we wanted to hack the thing that the app talked to 
but they actually did everything right around SSL cert validation and pinning and made man in the middling the traffic stream a pain in the, the butt. Uh, but they logged to the shared log buffer, to logcat, uh, the whole structure for the post message that we needed to be able to send to their web service to attack it. And it, of course, turned out to be massively vulnerable. So um, that was a nice little inf bit of information leakage. And just uh, during a class this past weekend, uh, we were playing around with a production app that we pulled from the market, which actually logged... Uh, a token, we believe logged a token related to uh, the user authenticating to this person's website right on the log. So any application could read that out and, um, you know, snarf that and put it somewhere else. So don't log credentials, don't log anything sensitive to shared log buffers or at all, if possible, um, especially not in production applications. Uh, if you're doing anything around um, logging, you know, there were, there were uh, alternative keys for Android, which would actually log um, what keys were being tapped, and that would go to the shared log buffer. So there you go with your backdoor keystroke logging. Don't log those things. Um, utilize anti-caching anti directives on the back end for content that's being uh, served to, um, to an application, because data does get cached for applications. They actually do have web web content being cached for them in their data directory. Um, debug your applications, it, obviously. Uh, and any third-party libraries that you're using, see what they're logging, see if they're, like ad networks, for instance, might be exfiltrating sensitive user data to some somewhere else, including like contacts or PII. Um, and test across as many platforms as possible, because there might be platform nuances or version nuances you don't understand. Um, we had this storage application that we tested one time. It's a multi, multi-platform application where you can access your stuff on the web or through the Android application or whatever. And as it turns out, slight usability bug um, when intercepting the response from the server that would tell us things like our current storage quota by changing the current, the current value that we used and the max value uh, or quota. Um, it would go and divide this to present like a nice little display and uh, would just lead to a uh, divide by zero error and it, um, they didn't handle that, so the application crashes, big deal. Um, they did some DRM stuff as well, which wasn't really DRM, but um, this XML blob comes back from the server and uh, would determine whether or not an, uh, a video could be shared. Um, but the decision was being made in the application itself, the client application that we have control over. So I want to go share this with you. Copyrighted, yes. Uh, oh, I can't, I can't share it. Nope. So here's the XML blob that comes back. I change it from view to share. The access control decision is made in the, app, the client app, and suddenly I can share it with whoever. So DRM bypass, because it wasn't really DRM. So Obviously not putting that logic in the, the client-side application itself, but enforcing it somewhere that you have more control over. Uh, so API-related issues. Um, as I mentioned before, because of this isolation or sandbox, applications preferably interact with each other through you know, an inter-process inter communication channel, if you will, by passing, passing intent messages back and forth. And um, these are basically just objects that define things like what an action, an action that an app wants to take, like view or main, uh, and the component that it wants to send that message to. If it doesn't specify that, there may be an application that's the default or implicit handler for that, uh, as well as any pertinent data. As we saw in that log output earlier, uh, me tapping on a link, you saw dat equals you know, sourceconference.com. And since the scheme for that is HTTP, colon slash slash, uh, the web browser is the default handler for that. So, and then there's a reference monitor in the Android runtime which checks to make sure that everything is copacetic, that the caller and the callee jive with permissions if permissions are being enforced for receiving or sending any of these intents. Um, so, generally activities have to be exported for uh, an app, one application to invoke an activity or UI 
on another application, and um, setting an intent filter will do things like, you know, handle a particular type of intent based on some criteria like the scheme, you know, the URI or protocol, um, or any any other criteria uh, that might be pertinent that a thing wants to receive. Um, developers can actually set. Um, can require the callee to bear custom permissions to uh, receive an intent, or the uh, caller to um, require the caller to have a permission in order to send an intent to a receiver. So these can be further restricted, and ideally are, um, by uh, in first creating a custom permission and then also setting protection level equals signature. What that does is says that only any application signed by the same key as the application that declared this custom permission can request this custom permission. There's also signature system, but that also opens it up to OEM uh, and Google applications as well. So they, if you don't want to trust them, don't set things like signature or system. Um, this kind of breaks, uh, could potentially break compatibility in some cases, but invoking um, uh, explicitly specifying the target component that you want to send in, uh, a message to is better because then someone, an application cannot register to be a higher priority intent receiver for something that you didn't expect it to be. So here's an example, really convoluted uh, but valid example for sending, uh, starting an activity. Um, we say we've got an intent message called foo. Uh, we want to invoke the action view, uh, the view action. We set the data to be bar colon slash slash some resource. Let's assume there's a protocol called bar, and we just start activity foo. And what this does is just says, I want to view, and here's the data, and whoever can handle that can handle it. So if your application that you have this special custom protocol or scheme for um, handles bar, but some other malicious application registers as a higher priority, uh, a higher priority intent filter to receive and handle the bar scheme, it would intercept this message first. Um, this would explicitly specify the component we want to receive this message. So we say, oh, s same thing except set component com.mycompany.myapp.myactivity. And the message is sent explicitly to uh, an application we know and a component uh, and an activity that we know. So applications can also register broadcast receivers, which are broadcast messages, things like um, SMS received. The tele telephony manager sends out a broadcast message to anyone who will listen uh, to notify that an SMS has been received. And that's how the messaging app intercepts that and responds to it accordingly, and how custom uh, you know, SMS messaging apps uh, deal with it as well. They just register as a uh, higher priority intent receiver. So. The principle of permissions applies here. You can uh, require the receiver to bear a custom permission before it, the message will be delivered and consumed by them, and vice versa. Um, the caller can also, the receiver can also require that the caller bear a permission to even talk to it. Um, use permissions wisely and uh, you know often, um, but generally, if it's if you are not doing that, don't just send highly sensitive data in a broadcast message for that anyone could register a receiver for. Don't forget that intents are actually an input point, and um, sanitizing input and controlling access to messages uh, you receive and messages you send and who will receive them um, is important, and also handling exceptions is really important. So ISEC Partners, for instance, has this uh, real application called Intent Fuzzer, which just enumerates everything that can receive an intent, activities, services broadcast receivers uh, and instrumentations, and just sends null objects to them to see what happens. So it just null, you know, they call it, it's, it says null fuzzing. So it just sends null objects and everything crashes, including Google's own services uh, on Android. Um, so we see here the clock that was provided to me uh, as a stock application crashes, uh, alert service crashes for a null pointer exception. Um, so like pretty much everything, everything crashes here. Um, third party applications fall to this and Google's own applications fall to this because they don't handle no pointer exceptions. So um, speaking about um, not using IPC mechanisms properly and kind of shooting themselves in the foot, uh, we had a, 
uh, an engagement that we did where we tested uh, a while back, while a while back, uh, this custom app framework. Think of it like a write once, run anywhere across, you know, Windows Mobile, BlackBerry, Android, etc. And it was basically just HTML and JavaScript uh, widgets, like games and 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 stuff. So. Um, we actually could talk to the, uh, it was composed of two components, a widget installer and a widget runtime. And we wanted to talk to either of them through in passing intent messages. Well, the widget installer even wouldn't let us um, send messages to it and invoke the, you know, we couldn't like fish a user to get them to install our malicious widget because we couldn't even invoke that activity because we didn't have uh, the appropriate permission, only the widget um, runtime and some other applications like system applications had that so we actually see it's a little redacted sorry but you see protection level signature or system for this permission uh, in this permission block in the manifest we just try to use the activity manager to invoke view uh, we pass in some uh, mime type data and a path to our widget and we tell that the widget install activity to pop up to prompt the user to install our widget and we get permission denial um, because we don't have whatever that permission is well that sucks um, well, as it turns out, they didn't understand things like shared UID, where two applications signed by the same key can share user ID and access the same parts of the file system. So they just made their widgets directory world writable so that the two UIDs for the installer and runtime could read and write um, that directory, which meant anyone else could read, write that directory, which meant our malicious application could overwrite widgets and add in content, which is what it did. So if you look at the, the permissions here, you'll see um, read, write, X, you know, world writable, world readable, and we have a chess widget which was world writable and world readable in our app that just injected content so that when the user opened it, it just had a JavaScript pop-up. Um, so again, they didn't couple the widget runtime um, with the widget management application via IPC. There could have been a program there could have been a programmatic way to do this without you know botching it on the file system. And um, they sidestep the permissions model by doing really bad old Unixy file permissions management. So, to conclude my whirlwind tour of Android uh, application security uh, dumbness, uh, don't store sensitive data, especially in plain text and without proper access control. Be aware of, of system nuances, things like you know the zygote uh, umask uh, inheritance issue uh, for native code. Um, and any you know memory issues if you have native code and uh, you're deploying on like Android 1.5, you know the, you probably opened it up to more vanilla, you know exploit issues, you know vanilla uh, buffer overflow vulnerabilities maybe, um, but just know that you know there are basically no exploit mitigations there. Um, think about uh, what permissions an application really needs. Um, you know, don't request more than necessary. Of, you know, unless you're a mobile AV application, then you have to, apparently. Uh, and any security facilities provided by the platform, like ASEC uh, or secure containers or crypto libraries or pretty much anything, um, be aware of them and use them. Don't necessarily roll your own uh, unless you're really good at it. Um, and everyone's always really good at it. Um, and just remember that anything you build on it may have its own issues. Um, Flash, WebKit, OpenSSL, Bionic, LibC, so forth and so on. Um, so there's also the OWASP Mobile Security Project, which is attempting to bring together resources around uh, mobile application security uh, in particular, but also just mobile security in general. Um, so you know you can go there and get involved and get spammed on the mailing list by some guy who posts a bunch of off-topic things. It's not me. Um, any questions? I have about five minutes. There's my contact information and stuff. All right, I'll take that as a no. Well, thanks for putting up with uh, the alternate presentation for this slot. Uh, you know, thanks for coming out to Source. And uh, if you have any questions, feel free to uh, come up here and talk to me for the next few minutes, or you know, out in the hallway in the hallway track. Thanks.